The word biscuit derives from the Latin word biscuitus, which means twice cooked. The origins of biscuits are ambiguous, as the biscuit just seems to be a staple that has been around forever. Many articles talk of biscuits as if Southerners are born with the biscuit recipe in hand. The truth of the matter is that both inside and outside the community in Appalachia came to believe that Southerners were getting diseases because of their diets, and cornbread became a target. The alternative of cornbread was biscuits, which came to be due to the perishable and expensive nature of yeast, and the fact that the only ingredients required for biscuits, specifically beaten biscuits, are a fat, liquid, and flour. However, the wheat flour traditionally used for biscuits was not easily accessible to the people of Appalachia, and thus class divisions based on biscuits and cornbread began. Additionally, we know that there is a stark contrast between biscuits of Europe and biscuits of America, specifically biscuits of Appalachia, but where the divide originates from is unclear. Some sources claim that there are roots that tie the biscuit to the biscuits of Europe, what we consider cookies, while others still insist that biscuits spawned out of the scarcity of ingredients and creativity of southern bakers. There is a consensus, however, in the discussion of beaten biscuit as the premier biscuit of Appalachia. But how did biscuits go from a literal labor of love that needed to be beaten 300 times for family and 500 times for guests to something that chefs have decided should be as handled at as little as possible? We begin our journey pre-Civil War era where beaten biscuits are king. Beaten biscuits use no leavening agent and instead rely on being beaten and folded multiple times in order to incorporate air into the dough, as leavening agents were not yet readily available and yeast was expensive and perishable. The air pockets cause the dough to expand while in the oven, and thus rise. A key question here in discussing the intersectional backgrounds of foods becomes who is responsible for this labor? Who shoulders the responsibility of spending hours of beating air into the dough? With the rise, if you will, of baking soda and baking powder in the mid-1800s, a new type of biscuit emerged, ones made with these leavening agents. These leavening agents change not only the process and chemistry of biscuits, but the taste as well. The beaten biscuits of the past were often flatter and harder, while these new biscuits were fluffier and lighter due to the inclusion of baking soda or more often baking powder. Traditionally, baking powder was single acting, meaning it needed an acid to react with in order to create carbon dioxide, and thus air bubbles, within the dough as it bakes. This single action could either occur at room temperature on the counter, which is fast action, or at high temperature in the oven, which is slow action. There is an added element of danger when dealing with double action baking powder, however. Too much of it and your biscuits will develop a metallic aftertaste due to the inclusion of sodium aluminum sulfate as a component that allows a double action rather than a single action. This change to the chemistry of baking powder started around 1885 and ensured that the release of carbon dioxide would not happen until later in the baking process. Biscuits evolved out of necessity and lack of time to commit to such a task with drop biscuits. These drop biscuits are more closely related to scones in both the texture of the dough and the process of formation. Their name stems from the process of just being able to drop the dough onto a sheet pan to bake rather than the labor-intensive method associated with beaten biscuits. These drop biscuits have since evolved into cat head biscuits, which are simply just drop biscuits that are the size of a cat's head, as seen at the ever-popular local Asheville restaurant Biscuit Head. This evolution calls issues of class into discussion as we must always consider who gets to participate in these trendy food areas and who these foods are accessible to. Oftentimes, the cat head biscuit is the one we think of contemporarily when we think of a biscuit, even though historically it took a very long time to get to this version. In class, we've discussed a lot surrounding Elizabeth Englehart's piece, Beating the Biscuit, in which Englehart highlights the difference in class structure when dealing with the type of biscuit one might make. Englehart highlights how women of upper-class status would often cook a form of beaten biscuit because they had the financial and social well-being to do so. Upper-class women not only had the means to get the ingredients to make a beaten biscuit, but they also had the time at their disposal to do the labor-intensive process to make these biscuits. Additionally, many upper-class women had hired help, specifically African-American women, in their kitchens, so oftentimes those women were not even the ones participating in making the biscuits. In contrast, the lower class women of Appalachia often did not make any sort of beaten biscuit and rather cooked cornbreads or variation thereof. The women of Appalachia did not have the money to buy imported wheat flour and so instead they used what was at their disposal, which was most often corn. The women of Appalachia also did not have the same amount of time that upper class women had since Appalachian women were often working outside of the home in addition to feeding and caring for their own families. This contrast in what biscuits are being made in different households is directly tied to the social class that these women found themselves in. 
Despite social class determining what a true biscuit might be, biscuits have long been the iconic symbol of the South. Some of the most popular pieces of Southern literature feature biscuits as a prominent item served for a meal. When looking at literature from the Civil War era, one sees a distinction of a biscuit as a Southern food. Margaret Mitchell's classic novel, Gone with the Wind, features multiple scenes with the main character, Scarlett O'Hara, eating biscuits. Mitchell writes, Scarlett dropped her eyes to her plate and nibbled daintily on a beaten biscuit with an elegance and an utter lack of appetite that would have won Mammy's approval. We can glean here that Scarlett is not only used to having biscuits as part of her diet and that Mammy makes biscuits on a regular basis, but also that Scarlett's preferred biscuit is a beaten biscuit. Biscuits are a part of Scarlett's Southern identity in addition to being part of her identity as a lady. We can see the traces of Englehart's argument here. Privileged Southern women with the means and money to have beaten biscuits were clearly eating them. However, Mitchell's depictions of biscuits also presses up against Englehart's argument a little bit. Later in the story, in the midst of the war, Mitchell details the Yankees' blockade and the impact it has on the Confederates' day-to-day life, stating, White flour was scarce and so expensive that cornbread was universal instead of biscuits, rolls, and waffles. Here, Mitchell presents the idea that cornbread might not have been exclusively an Appalachian woman's choice for bread, but rather that when white flour was scarce for even the upper-class Southern women, cornbread was made as an alternative. This complicates Englehart's divide between the upper-class Southern women's biscuit and the lower-class Appalachian woman's cornbread. But it does reaffirm Englehart's idea that Appalachian women in the Progressive Era did not initially make beaten biscuits due to the lack of accessibility to the resource of white flour. Similar presentations of biscuits in popular literature can be seen in Toni Morrison's Beloved. The main character, Setha, is a former slave, now freed and living in a post-Civil War Ohio. In the opening chapter of the book, she recounts her experience as a slave as she bakes biscuits. Morrison writes, The fat white circles of dough lined the pans in rows. Once more, Setha touched a wet forefinger to the stove. She opened the oven door and slid the pan of biscuits in. Morrison presents an interesting dynamic here. Setha, as a former slave, bakes biscuits because no doubt she knows how to make them from her time cooking for her master. However, given Setha's status as a former slave, it is interesting that she chooses to bake biscuits instead of cornbread. Since flour was more expensive, especially following the war, it would seem more appropriate for Setha to bake cornbread both culturally and socioeconomically. However, this isn't the case. Morrison utilizes a symbol of the white upper-class South and Appalachia to subvert the very class and race issues that Englehart highlights in her article. The recipes for biscuits in cookbooks vary from relatively simple recipes to more complex recipes featuring labor-intensive processes to achieve the perfect biscuit. In Natalie Dupree's collection of recipes, Southern Biscuits, Dupree features some of the easiest biscuit recipes. One of these easy recipes, Allison's Easy Sour Cream Biscuits, calls for just self-rising flour and sour cream. The sour cream is simply folded into the flour. Biscuits are cut from dough and placed on a tray to be baked. The sour cream supposedly makes these biscuits lighter and fluffier. In a contemporary biscuit cookbook, Biscuit Head's very own cookbook, in fact, it calls for the addition of cake flour. Traditionally, recipes for biscuits call for an all-purpose flour, or later, self-rising flour. Cake flour has a lower protein content, 8 to 9 percent, whereas AP flour has a much higher protein content, 10 to 13 percent. The lower protein content makes cake flour the weakest flour and creates a lighter and fluffier batter or dough. This showcases the trend of biscuits becoming bigger, lighter, and fluffier in comparison to the hard beaten biscuit of the past. Despite 
the quite dramatic transformation of biscuits, they remain a symbol of the South, and more specifically, Appalachia. With each new recipe and form biscuits take on, their influence only grows. So roll up your sleeves, roll out your dough, or don't, up to you, and enjoy a biscuit, whatever your favorite may be.